Well, hey, we are glad to get to join you today. As we sing, we invite you right from where you are to join us and sing along. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. you are again we invite you to lift up your voices to open your minds and your hearts to the truths of the words that we are singing today as we lift up high the name of Jesus we worship him through our song sing with me my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I did not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. In Christ alone, 
just invite you to take a posture of open-hearted surrender as we take a moment to just reflect on the goodness of God in your lives. Lord Jesus, you are faithful. You are everlasting. You are worthy of our praise. We open our hearts to you today. Holy Spirit, do your work in us. Righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Amen? Amen. Some of you have reached out to me and asked me how the choir and orchestra are doing. They're doing well. Matter of fact, they, uh, they're on the sideline for the time being, but they just finished up a project that you're going to experience here in just a few moments. About 80 of them uh, at home played their instrumental part or they sang their part. And they sent those in, and we have some talented people here on our staff that put all that together. And you're going to get it here. I bowed on my knees and cried holy in just a few moments. I've been living with that song and those lyrics for the last couple weeks. And I thought I'd just share a few things that are on my heart. We're going to continue in our series today in Paul's letter to the Philippians. And I think a little bit the older I get, the more of an appreciation and respect to have for the Apostle Paul. He seemed to be able to narrow his focus, you know, just to embrace only the things that are eternal. Remember, he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul seemed to understand that God created us for good works and for his glory and his purposes and our time here on earth. But Paul also knew that dying meant an immediate passage into the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. This next song, it, it speaks of someone who's taken their first step into heaven and they encounter their loved ones and they encounter the great patriarchs of the church. But 
<laughs> it seems like they graciously ask all those folks to step aside and they say boldly and loudly, I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus because he's the one who died for me. Pastor Paul always reminds those folks during a, a funeral, especially the family, that heaven is going to be a great time for reunions, and it is. But I think mostly we're going to be occupied with worshiping Jesus and enjoying the wonders of heaven. So in this next song, I encourage you to, to participate. Some of you know the song. Uh, sing out the chorus with us. And as we sing and engage and worship together, let me remind you, we are joining a great heavenly choir that is, is crying out continually, holy, 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 and all glory be to Jesus, the Son of God. Let's worship together. city called glory so bright and so fair when I entered the gates I cried holy the angels
I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet My Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still God, thank you for awakening our hearts to the hope of heaven through these songs this morning. And my prayer is that we would be a people not just waiting on heaven, 
but actively participating with you in bringing heaven to earth by doing the next right thing. I pray, God, that our eyes would be transfixed on the face of Jesus right now by choosing to see Christ in all of creation and in every body that bears your image, especially those bodies that are different from our own. And God, would you reveal to us individually and also collectively as a church where we are resisting heaven on earth so that your prayer can become our prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the name and essence of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Amen, amen. I, if the camera was like zoomed up any closer, you would like see the goosebumps <laughs> on my arms from just the choir and then following it with that song. Uh, what a special so moment. Good. Thank you to everyone who was a part of that, the vulnerability to sing in your living right. room and send that in. And uh, yeah, I get to hear our choir and orchestra, which is just a pillar of Christ Community Church and uh, miss seeing all your faces. Thanks again for those moments of worship. Hey, if you're somebody who's new, or maybe you just stumbled across this stream on Facebook because somebody shared it, hey, welcome. We're so excited to, to have you worshiping at home with us today. We'd love to just hear from you, connect with you, uh, not bombard you with a bunch of questions, but just hear about who you are and maybe connect you in a group or community. And so you can go to cccomaha.org connect, and uh, we'd love to, to get you connected here today. Yeah, and I'm Emily, and I work in our residency department. Our program is a two-year program where our residents gain practical ministry experience while at the same time earning their master's and crown college. And the purpose of the program is to raise up and equip next-generation leaders for church ministry. Um, it's just been so fun to see the church come alongside us and support our residents. And we do have a couple practical ways that you can continue to help and serve. Uh, pray for our residents. Continue praying. Um, this has been a crazy season. Uh, so especially during this time, all the unknowns and transitions, uh, ministry changes, yeah. if you would just keep them in your prayers, also for their support raising during this time. And we have a new cohort joining us, cohort four. We have eight residents coming August 3rd, and we are so excited for them to join. So one specific need that we have is host homes for our new cohort. Uh, specifically, one for a married couple and two for singles. So if that's something you've been thinking about or God has been pressing on your heart, please reach out to me. My info is right there. Shoot me an email, call the church. You can also check out more info on the website, or I'd love to meet up with you to tell you more. Yeah. Um, yeah, what it means to become a host. Yeah, and that's an awesome ministry that our church has had for decades. Mm -hmm. we, we turned it into our residency program, but a little over a decade ago, I got to be a part of this two-year intentional discipleship a leader training in, in the church, and I'm so humbled and grateful for it. And I know my parents even were host home for a resident that right. just graduated this last year, and they don't have some giant house, so it's not about having some giant house and having it all together, just a spare room, a bathroom uh, that's spare for right. them to use, and it's a great way to invest into the next generation of church workers. Right. And so right. we'd love to invite you into that. We're so grateful for a church that does invest, mm -hmm. a church that not just invests their time and their houses, but their treasure, their finances. We're so grateful for the way that you have invested uh, your financial gifts over, over this last season. That's been difficult. Right. And, and, uh, and so we're grateful for those who have given uh, to the church. If you're somebody who maybe you've just been attending lately and, and you've gotten plugged into CCC and you want to give to what God mm -hmm. is doing through uh, this local church, we'd invite you to go to CCC Omaha dot org slash give or you can text uh, or you can call that number if you need uh, more information of how you can do that but we'd love to partner with you as we partner with the god of the universe who changes lives who raises up the next generation of church leaders uh, who also feeds people in miami like we talked about a little bit earlier and even in our own inner city and speaking of feeding people in our own inner city we've been partnering with mission church uh, our friend myron and the people down there over uh, the last about 12 weeks to be providing meals, lunches, and suppers 
for families that just don't have the ability to get that. And I know there's school programs, but they're not even having the, the transportation to get to those drop-off spots. And so part of this is people delivering these meals to homes. And you have been so gracious and generous as a church over the last few months, and we want to keep that up. You can go to cccomaha.org help. If you want information about what kind of food items to bring, you can bring them here to the church, or you can even sign up to deliver some of those meals on Monday mornings really early. And so thank you, church, and we want to just continue to, to invite you to, to donate and to support uh, our own city and, and those people that need uh, to be uh, fed physically so that we have the opportunity to feed them spiritually. So thank you so much again for your generosity. Well, in just a moment, we are going to hear a great message from Mark as he continues in the series through the book of Philippians. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much that we can gather today to worship you together, whether virtually, Lord, or <clears throat> Facebook or website, Lord, but I just thank you that we have the means to do that, Lord. Um, would you speak to us, Lord? Uh, would you open our ears, open our hearts, our eyes to receive the message that you want us to hear today, Lord? Would you free us from distractions or any discouragement that we might be experiencing personally today? And um, give us your hope and your joy and remind us of your truth. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower Pastor Mark, Lord, would you just speak through him your message to us, God, and we just thank you for him, Lord, and his leadership to us, especially during this time, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Alex. And uh, great to be with you all in your homes uh, as we worship the Lord together today. Uh, I want to just give a quick reflection on last Wednesday's worship and prayer night. Uh, some people have asked how that's gone, and all I can say is, wow, it was an amazing experience for us to be able to be gathered together uh, in Jesus' name and be worshiping together and be praying together. There were so many people who reflected afterwards when they came, they go, my soul just needed that so bad. And some are like, I didn't realize how much I needed that human connection or that connection with God. And uh, it was such a powerful experience. Uh, hundreds of people combined here and online, and we're grateful for that. Uh, such a powerful experience. We've decided we're going to do it each of the next three Wednesday nights as well. And uh, if you're somebody who's interested in that, we would invite you to be a part of what's happening here in the room or what's happening online. And uh, it's 645 Wednesday nights. We worship together. We pray together. It's just super powerful. We kind of feel like it's that time between the resurrection of Jesus and Pentecost Sunday where they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come and they were all in one place and praying together. That's the kind of flavor that we have. And I'd invite you to come out and join us for that on Wednesday night. But for this sermon, I'd like to start off with a pop quiz, a pop quiz. And you can either get out a piece of paper if you want or put it on your phone or just keep track in your head. I'll probably go a little bit too fast, actually, for you to write everything down. But see if you can follow me on this quiz, okay? Can you name the five richest people in the world today? Can you name the five richest people? I'm guessing you may be able to get three, but I doubt if you can get all of the top five. Okay, can you name the last five Heisman Trophy winners? Last five Heisman Trophy winners, best athlete in college football. Could you name the five, any five actually, New York Times best-selling authors from 2019? Any of the five top-selling authors. Could you name five Nobel Prize winners from 2019? I could go on with the last five World Series winners or the last five U.S. Open Women's Tennis Champions, but you get the picture here. These are people who have reached the pinnacle of greatness in their arena, and my guess is that you could hardly name one in each of those categories. I know that's true for me. And now let's look at a different list. Could you name the five people who have most influenced your life and write their names down? Could you name five teachers from high school? 
Could you name your five best friends? You know, it's an easy illustration to see the dramatic difference between your memory recall of people who have achieved greatness versus people who are just close to you. The truth about human beings is that we are most deeply influenced by a small group of people that gather around us. And if you're talking about your impact on this world, you are most likely to influence a small group of people, not masses, and through your personal interest, not your achieved greatness. Anthropologist Robin Dunsbar says that human brains have a limit on the number of meaningful relationships that they can have. It lands at about five intimate bonds, 15 close friends, 50 friends, and 150 casual friends. Now, that inner circle, that top five or top 15, is an amazing gift. One of my friends loves to say that you are the average of the five people who influence you most. And the question for today is partly asking, who are you surrounding yourself with that's going to mold who you're going to become? But it's also, are you this kind of a person so that you can influence a small group of people with a great deal of depth? Everybody wants to be awesome. But the truth of the matter is, God tends to use people who are ordinary in a small group of people to have a dramatic impact in their lives. So today, we're going to meet some ordinary people, two ordinary guys, the kind of guys you would sit on a ball field with or shoot hoops or sit with at the next prayer meeting. Their names are Timothy and Epaphroditus, otherwise known as Tim and Fred. You guys see I get Fred from Epaphroditus. I could have called him Fraud or Frode, which would have been more accurate, but I just like how Fred rolls off the tongue a little bit better. So we're going to call him Tim and Fred, or more accurately, Trusty Tim and Faithful Fred. These two guys were guys that were in Paul's inner circle, and he writes about them in Philippians chapter 2. So you can turn in your Bibles or Pull out your phones, your fake Bibles, and uh, go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. That's where we'll be reading. While you do that, let me give you a bigger picture of what's happening in Philippians. So in Philippians chapter 2, we start with this great premise that Paul is encouraging the Philippians to have two key characteristics, that they would have unity, that they would be of one mind, that they would love each other, that they would never betray each other, and that they would exhibit humility. In fact, at the end, he says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. That's in verse 4. And then in verse 5, he has this beautiful poem, this hymn that they would have sung on a regular basis about the theology of Jesus' life. And it's a theology of descent into greatness. It's about how Jesus left his heavenly throne room for the footstool of earth. And then from being a human being, he took on the nature of a servant. And from a servant mindset, he went to death, even death on a cross. And then he was laid into the grave. It's this steps downward. And Paul says, you want to experience greatness, you got to be like that. You need to be like Jesus. Now, some of us may look at that example and go, whoa, the whole heaven to earth thing, that's just out of my league. There's no way that I'm going to accomplish that. I see the model there, but can you give me something a little more realistic? So then Paul offers himself as an example. And he says, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice, and you should too. Well, Paul's also one of those all-star examples. So you have the superhero Jesus, the hero Paul, and then he says, okay, let's get really granular here. Let's take the example of two ordinary guys, Tim and Fred. And Tim and Fred exemplify this whole idea of unity and humility. And let's do a bit more of an extended play on their two lives. So that's what we're going to take a look at. Tim has six verses, beginning at verse 19, trusty Tim. This is what it says about him. Paul says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show a genuine concern for your welfare. Because everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself. 
because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. All right, so this is Timothy. And Timothy actually gets a lot of airtime in the New Testament. You see him in the book of Acts. You see him here in Philippians. There's two books named after him, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. In fact, he's such a robust character in the New Testament that I named my oldest son, Caleb Timothy, after this New Testament character in hopes that he would grow up to be a lot like him. One of the things we know about Timothy is that Timothy was raised in a household with a mother and a grandmother. We know that his father was Greek and his mother was Jewish, but besides that, we know nothing about his father. It's as if he's irrelevant to his life. And we don't know if dad died or just worked so hard or was gone all the time, but it seems as though there was no father figure in his life. Instead, we hear in first, or 2 Timothy chapter 1 about his mother Lois and his grandmother Eunice and the profound impact that they had on his life. Well, Paul's on his first missionary journey, and he's going through Asia Minor. He goes past Ephesus and winds up in this small podunk town called Lystra. Now, Lystra was not a big city like Ephesus. It was the little city outside of the big city. It was like uh, Wahoo, Nebraska, or Red Oak, Iowa, an unimpressive stop. But Paul stops there. And he plants a church. And as was his normal custom, he would talk to the Jewish people first. And who shows up at the meeting but Lois and Eunice. And Lois and Eunice are some of the first people to come to faith in Jesus. They lead their son Timothy to faith in Jesus. And then Paul moves on to the next city. Well, Paul came back later to Lystra on his second missionary journey. And what do you know? He finds that Lois and Eunice are still faithful to Jesus. And Timothy has grown impressively in his faith. So he says, hey, Timothy, why don't you join me on this missionary journey? Wow, chance of a lifetime. Timothy gets to go with the Apostle Paul to proclaim, proclaim the resurrection and start churches from city to city. So he says yes, and he goes with Paul. And this passage says that he worked with him as a son with his father. Such a cool image, image there, because Paul, who didn't have a son connects with Timothy, who didn't have an active father in his life, and they work together for the sake of the gospel. And just like a silversmith father might show his silversmith son the tools of the trade, or a farmer dad helps his farmer son to become a great farmer, so Paul helped Timothy to become a great leader and pastor. And he did become a pastor, and eventually ended up as the bishop of Ephesus in his later years. Paul was investing in Timothy like a son with his father so that he might grow in his faith. Now, Timothy himself has three great characteristics that we can see from this passage. Three things that make him a great inner circle guy. Somebody that you would want to have with you side by side wherever you go. And whether you're looking for people to be in your inner circle or you're asking what makes me a great inner circle guy... Timothy is somebody who represents this well. Here's what he says. He says, Timothy is tender-hearted. In other words, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. I mean, there's people who might fake being interested. They, they might be generically interested in people. But Philippians, I want you to know that Timothy deeply cares about you. I'll bet they talked about the Philippians. I'll bet they prayed for the Philippians. They had been to Philippi together, and so you could imagine that Timothy was deeply concerned. And if you want to have great friends for your inner circle, there has got to be some degree of affinity and companionship. There has to be a genuine concern for the welfare of the other person. It's that face-to-face -face connection that you go, you matter to me. But Paul and Timothy took that to the next level because they not only had the face-to-face -face companionship, they had the side-by-side -side companionship. And I think this is really true, especially for guys trying to develop deep friendships, that the friendship goes even deeper when you work together side-by-side -side with a common mission in mind. 
That's why sports are so bonding for guys. That's why being on mission together for the sake of the kingdom is so bonding with guys because you talk with each other as you're doing the same thing together. That's what koinonia friendship is all about. It's the bonds that you make as you are on a common mission. And Paul knew that nobody could represent him better than Timothy. He says, I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon. If he's still in prison, if he can't make it there, he's going to send Timothy. Why? Because Timothy has moved from being that kid from Lystra to being the next best thing to the Apostle Paul visiting you. How's that for a mark of status in his life? He loves to serve. He loves the people. He's tenderhearted. He cares about you, so I'm sending him your way. Second thing about Timothy is that he is thoughtful. He was thoughtful. Paul says, Most people look to their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ, but not Timothy. Timothy is a guy who's not interested in his own self. He is interested in the interests of Jesus Christ. You could say that he's thoughtful or probably more accurate. It just fits the theme of the the passage that he is humble. He's humble. Now, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Isn't that a good quote? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Because sometimes Christians or pastors will teach you that your goal as a follower of Jesus is to become so aware of your sinfulness and your worminess that humility is all about thinking about how dirty and awful you are. And while it is true that we're marked and scarred and marred by sin and none of us is anywhere near perfect... It is also true that we're deeply loved by God, that he sacrificed his one and only son so that we might have new life, that we've been reclaimed as children of God, that we've moved from being sinners to being saints, and that one day we will reign together with God. That is our new identity that we have in Jesus. But our goal is not to just sit back and brag about that. Our goal is not to become self-aggrandized around that. It's simply to become self-forgetful. Humility is all about thinking of yourself less. And like Timothy, putting the interests of Jesus Christ and, as you see in verse 2, the interests of others above your own interests. That's what it looks like. These are the kind of people you want to be and you want to surround yourself with. Finally, the third characteristic of Timothy is that he was true. He was true. In other words, Timothy was loyal. Paul says, you know his proven character. As a son with his father, he worked with me. Timothy had been tested and proven over and over again. Because when Timothy and Paul left Lystra, Paul had a pattern that emerged. I don't know if it was his intentional strategy, but when you read about the adventures of Paul and Timothy in the book of Acts, you find this happening over and over again. So here's how it goes. Paul comes into a new city. He preaches the gospel, usually to Jewish people first, and then he goes out to the marketplace, teaches the people there. Before too long, Paul's big mouth is getting him into trouble. He gets persecuted, he gets beat up, he gets thrown in jail, he gets kicked out of the city and has to go on to the next city. But here's what he does. While Paul moves on to the next city to do his recon work, Timothy stays in the old city. And Timothy is a little bit quieter. He's not quite as obnoxious or likely to get into trouble. But he knows his stuff because he's been listening to Paul for so long. So he stays behind and gathers together all of the people who Paul has led to faith in Jesus and begins to faithfully pass on the truth to them and disciple them with the same kind of information, but a different spin on his personality. I love that about Timothy. That's why Timothy has proven himself. He's been to city after city after city, and he's discipled people, including people right there in Philippi. And faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. When you just keep on doing the right thing, what you find is that over time, that bears fruit in the people who are around you, and it will give you rewards in heaven. Now, some of you are saying, man, this inner circle relationship with a mentor and a mentee, this father, son thing, man, that is really cool. I would love to get involved with that. Maybe you're a young person who's looking for an older mentor. Maybe you're somebody who's older who says, I'd love to invest in somebody in their life. How do you go about doing that? Well, I'm going to talk to the younger people first. 
If, if you're somebody who's a younger, peop- a younger person, you may say, where do I even meet these kind of people? And I have to admit that it's challenging to do it in socially distanced online church. It's also challenging to do it when you've got a large worship center that's packed with people who are all facing the same direction. The truth is that the best way to be able to find somebody is to become a part of a journey group. And we've got couples groups and singles groups, groups that meet in homes. We've got men's group, our men of God group that meets Friday mornings. We've got women's group like our mops group, all kinds of groups at Christ Community Church. Become a part of one of those groups and then actually meet people so that you can determine whether you like them before you enter into any kind of a mentoring relationship. And I'm going to tell young people, I want you to be the ones who take the initiative in this relationship. And here's the reason why. It's because older people believe two lies about themselves. These are lies that come from the pit. But I'm telling you, most older people believe these two lies. And the two lies are this. Number one, I don't have that much to offer. I don't have that much to offer. And the other one is... Nobody would ever really be interested in meeting with me anyway. Those young people aren't interested in a relationship with somebody like me. You can break through both of those lies by doing one simple thing, and that is invite them out for coffee or buy them a cheap lunch or have them over to your house and grill up some hot dogs for them. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be impressive. Just invite them over. And when you do, say, can you tell me a little bit more about your story? Or, hey, here's something I'm dealing with these days. Can you give me your advice? Or what have you learned about parenting? Or whatever the questions are that you might have for them, just go ahead and bring it to the table and ask a few questions. You know what they'll discover? They'll discover two things all at once. One is, you know, actually, I do have a few things to offer here. I've been around the track a few times, and I have some opinions on these things. The second thing that they'll realize is that there really is somebody out there who might be interested in an investment in their lives. Young people, not only is that a fun encounter, but here's the bonus. Most of the time when you invite an older couple to do that, they'll then invite you back to their house. And because they're older, they have a bigger house and better food, and it's like a really good deal for you. So that kind of is a nice bonus in all this. Older people, let me talk to you for a moment. The truth is some of you really do believe this lie, that you don't have anything to offer or that nobody's really interested in you. I want you to know that there is a whole generation of high school, college, 20-something, 30-something people who would love to have someone who helps them chart the course for them. This world is way too complicated, way too challenging to go about doing it alone. And you're somebody who's qualified. Just think of these three things. Are these three things true of you? If you're somebody who has stayed faithfully married to the same person for 10 years, If you're somebody who's held down like a real life job successfully for 10 years, and if you're somebody who has studied the Bible, not like in any particular format, but you've just been faithful to try and keep up some regular regimen of studying the Bible for 10 years, if you've done those three things in your life, then you are a spiritual giant to some of these young people, and you need to invest in them. How do you find these young people? Well, the answer is the same for you. Become a part of a journey group where people get face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball, and you can figure out who are the people you like and resonate with in that context. Now, I know that June may not be the best time of year to join a journey group because some of them are slowing down. Your schedule may be packed. COVID is happening. It might be a little bit challenging. But you can, whether it's a Zoom journey group or an in-person journey group, There are some groups that are still meeting, or you may just say, you know what, I'm going to resolve today that I'm going to make that a priority this fall when groups ramp up again. You can even go to cccomaha.org slash connect, uh, or just go to our front page and click on the connect tab, and you can get connected in with a group that way. So that's Trusty Tim, and that's mentoring, and that's some possibilities of what you might experience here as a follower of Jesus. I'm going to shift now from Trusty Tim to Faithful Fred, okay? From Trusty Tim to Faithful Fred. There are also six verses about Faithful Fred. There's actually only seven verses about him in the New Testament. The last one we'll see a little bit later in chapter four. But most of what we know about Faithful Fred comes from these six verses right here. Here's what it says. But I think it's necessary 
to send back to you Epaphroditus, or Fred, my brother, my co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. Now pause there just for a minute. Did you notice Paul throws out three compliments right off the bat? He's my brother. He's my co-worker. He's my fellow soldier in the Lord. He's given him some great encouragement and kudos because as this is happening, Paul's sitting in a jail writing these things down. I imagine that Epaphroditus is right next to him as he's writing this letter to the Philippians that Epaphroditus will carry back. And he's saying these words, he is my brother, he's my co-worker, he is my fellow soldier. Wow, if Paul said that about you, imagine how it would fill your soul. Paul's being an encouragement to Epaphroditus there in prison. And when that letter gets read in public in Philippi, it's going to fill his soul once again. Paul's a great encourager as well as a great message writer. All right, so he's your messenger. That means he came from Philippi. He was sent from Philippi to Rome to take care of his needs. More on that later. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill. And he almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I'm all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help that you yourselves could not give me. Well, from this passage, you can figure out what the backstory is here from Philippians chapter 4. Paul winds up getting thrown in jail, and they catch wind of it back in Philippi. And Lydia, who's leading the church at the time, would say something like, hey, guys, Paul's in jail. He's going to need some finances. He's going to need some gifts in order to be able to survive in jail, because that's how it worked. When people were in jail, they needed their friends to bring them stuff. She says, let's take up a collection from the whole church and then we'll send it with somebody to Rome. Who will raise their hand to go to Rome? And it's faithful Fred raises his hand. He says, I'll take the gift to Paul in Rome, which meant a 600 mile journey on foot across Greece and Italy with a boat ride across the Adriatic Sea to get from where he was to get to Rome. You see, Epaphroditus was just a faithful guy. This was not a high-profile role. This is not one for which he would get a lot of kudos and a lot of credits or a lot of applause. It was just doing the next right thing. And with every step that he took towards Rome, he did the next right thing as he was going from where he was to getting to Rome. Well, on the way, he risked a lot of things. He risked bandits and robbers and violence, and he risked illness, which actually struck him. And in the ancient world, it worked different than it does in the United States. Here in the United States, when somebody gets ill, we expect that they're going to get better. Even if they go to the hospital, we expect that they're going to come out and get better. But in the ancient world, when somebody falls ill, particularly deeply ill, there's an expectation that that person is going to die. And so Paul was concerned that Epaphroditus was going to die, but by God's mercy and God's grace, he didn't die. He was able to recover and get back to full health once again, and Paul rejoiced on that. But he wanted to point out to the Philippians that that moment when Epaphroditus raised his hand and said, I'll be the one who takes the gift to Rome, he was risking his life for the very sake of the gospel. And people who are just faithful with the next thing are deserving of high honor. That's one thing that he did. He delivered the gift. The other thing that Epaphroditus is known for is he took the message back to Philippi. So when Paul's in jail, he's writing this message to the Philippians and says, who will do the 600-mile journey on foot to go back to Philippi to bring them this message? Epaphroditus was the guy who said, I'll do that. He had just risked his life and almost died, and he said, I'll do it again in order to get the word of God from Paul to Philippi. Now, he was just a faithful guy. He was just somebody who did the right next thing. But I want you to think about the ripple effect that Epaphroditus had on world history. I mean, you think about it. He brought this monetary gift to Paul that sustained him while he was in jail in Rome. 
We don't know if that made the difference of life or death for Paul, but everything that happened after Paul's life at this point could be credited towards that gift that was delivered by Epaphroditus. Besides that, Epaphroditus was the guy who took the letter back to Philippi, which means he probably was the guy who read it out loud in Philippi and probably the guy who did question and answer when everybody asked, so what did Paul mean by this? What did Paul mean by that? He was the first teacher of the book of Philippians, and we know that he was successful in delivering it because we have the book of Philippians to this day. In fact, that book that Epaphroditus carried, which would have been just a scroll at the time, has had a profound impact on world history and his success in being faithful in just doing the next right thing has had an impact on your life and my life. We're studying it even to this day. Which leads me to an important main point. Just do the next right thing and God will work out the big picture. We never know the ripple effects of our strong actions on a small group of people. Our intentionality with a small group can have a ripple effect across the world. Just do the next right thing and God will work out the big picture. Somebody told me a little bit uh, between services that that's kind of a line from Frozen 2. I want you to know I had no idea. I got it from the Holy Spirit and not from Frozen 2 this week. But I hope it's something that you'll think about. In fact, between now and the end of the message, I hope you'll be considering what is the next right thing for you to do. And it'll be different for different people. The Spirit will guide you in that. Maybe your next right thing is to buy a pile of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and, or peanut butter and jelly and bring it to Christ Community Church so it can be distributed to kids that are food deprived right now during COVID-19. Maybe... Your next right thing is to call a senior who may be feeling lonely during this time. Maybe your next right thing is to tell an inspirational story to a coworker or share your excitement about Jesus with them. Maybe your next right thing is to house a resident that God's tapping on your shoulder to do that thing. Maybe it's to write a thank you note to somebody who has been good to you. I know my next right thing that I'll be doing this afternoon, I was convicted by when I was preparing the message yesterday, is I've got some repair that needs to be done with a friend who I deeply love. And I'll be working on that this afternoon. Maybe your right next step is joining a journey group. Maybe your right next step is a really big deal thing, like God's inviting you to foster or adopt a child. Or God is inviting you to do some research into mass incarceration because that's just been brought up in you as you've watched all the racial tension in the last few days and you want to be a part of the solution. I don't know what it is, but I hope you'll invite God in to say, okay, God, what's my next right thing? Something I could do today. Kelly read me a story a little bit earlier this week uh, from a book called uh, let's see, A Life Beyond Amazing by David Jeremiah. And it touched me so deeply that I thought I'd read it to you today the same way that she read it to me. It's about Lisa Fenn, a producer for ESPN, who just went about doing the next right thing. And God did something cool through her. In 2009, Lisa Fenn was an ESPN Features television producer looking for a good story. She found it when she met and filmed two young wrestlers at Cleveland's Lincoln West High School. Seven years later, she wrote about what became a life-changing experience. D'Artagnan Crockett was the high school's top wrestling talent. A winner in multiple weight classes, D'Artagnan was also homeless and legally blind. When Lisa met him, he subsisted on the soggy mozzarella sticks and bruised apples served in cafeteria lunches. And perched atop D'Artagnan's back, yes, riding on his back, was wrestling teammate Leroy Sutton. Leroy traveled around up there because he had no legs and the school had no elevator. When he was 11, he was hit by a freight train. Paramedics saved his life, but his left leg was amputated below the knee, 
his right leg below the hip. Lisa filmed the two boys and their world for five months. Later, editing their story, Carry On, she prayed that just one viewer would be moved to help the boys in a meaningful way. Her prayer was answered. Viewers around the world took on the boys into their hearts, and emails filled her inbox offering help. And that's when love took over. Lisa personally responded to nearly 1,000 emails. And she just, she just did the next right thing. She managed donations, speaking invitations, financial aid forms, and college visits, all while ensuring that D'Artagnan and Leroy were finally fed on a daily basis. The generosity of ESPN viewers made it possible for Leroy to move to Arizona to study video game design at Collins College. He became not only the first in his family to graduate from high school, but also the first to receive a college diploma. The attention brought D'Artagnan a different kind of training. In March of 2010, coaches invited him to live at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs to learn the Paralympic sport of judo. There, he would have shelter, sport, mentors, schools, medical care, and as he proudly showed Lisa on a visit to Colorado, his first bed. And against the odds, D'Artagnan earned a spot on the 2012 Paralympic team going to the London Olympics. And there he won the bronze. When the, medical, or when the medal was draped around D'Artagnan's neck, Leroy and Lisa were there to see it. Things like this don't happen to kids like us, he cried on that unimaginable night, his face beaming bronze, his tears soaking Lisa's shoulder. And he's right, Lisa wrote. Blind and legless kids from the ghettos don't get college educations and shiny accolades. But they should. And that's why I stayed. Because hope and love and rejoicing and redemption can happen to kids like them. During a visit to the eye doctor in 2009, D'Artagnan included Lisa on the consent form so she could access his records if need be. Later on that day, she got a call from the office administrator. I just thought you should know that D'Artagnan wrote on his consent form today, next to your name on the release, there's a space that says, relationship to patient. And D'Artagnan wrote, guardian angel. You know, Lisa wasn't a superhero like Paul. She was just a loving person who did the next right thing. My prayer is that that'll be true for you. Because God loves to use ordinary people like ESPN producers, maintenance supervisors, graphic design consultants, computer engineers, and dads. He doesn't invite us to be superheroes, but he does invite us to just do the next right thing. So I wanted to give you guys the gift of a minute to reflect on what your next right thing might be. So we'll let the music play in the background. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and just reflect and say, okay, God, what is my next right thing? Something that you can do this afternoon Maybe small, maybe big, but it's the next right thing that God is inviting you to. So would you bow your heads and take a few moments to reflect, yield yourself to God and say, God, what is my next right thing? Let's pray together.
And so God, I wanna pray that you would be intersecting our friends as they reflect right now. God, I pray for people who are saying, you know, I think my next step is just to trust God more. Maybe you've been exploring faith in Jesus. Maybe you're somebody who has had some fresh revelations about the goodness of God and you go, what I really need more than anything is God in my life. And God, I pray that you'd make yourself real to them. I pray that you'd give them the courage to hold out their hand and say, I wanna say yes to Jesus and put my hand in the hand of the carpenter from Nazareth and trust you to lead my life. God, I think there's people who are here who you've given a small thing to do. And I pray, God, that you would give them the initiative and the thoughtfulness to just go ahead and get that thing done today. Whether it's joining a journey group or housing a resident or showing love towards somebody who needs a little touch. God, I pray that you'd give them the courage to do that right next thing before the sun goes down today. And God, for those who you've given a big deal thing for them to do, for them to start tackling, would you give them the courage and the resolve to not only do that today, but what they need to do tomorrow and the next day and the next day to continue moving after that big thing? God, I believe that you prompt those things in people's hearts, and so I pray that that will take root in someone's heart and they'll be able to execute that by your strength and by your power. And God, we pray that this group of people, thousands of people who are online, who are part of Christ Community Church, by doing the next right thing, God, would you help us all to become this agent of major change in our city? God, we call out to you for our city. We know that there's trouble these days. We know that there's differences in how races are perceiving things. We know, God, that there are injustices that are very real. We know that there's broken relationships and broken trust. And Father, we also believe that you're the one who can repair those things and put them back together again. So would you, by the power of your Holy Spirit and through your people, make that happen? And God, we pray for those who are in leadership right now. We pray for police chiefs all around America who are in a very difficult place, who are trying to protect and serve people. Would you give them wisdom in the way that they go about doing their jobs? God, we pray for our police chief and for our mayor and for our city council. We pray for our governor and our state representatives that you would give them wisdom and insight and foresight to do their jobs well. Father, we pray for our senators, our congressmen, for our president, Would you help them to all respond with class and with dignity and wisdom and insight to be able to bring the very best, especially, God, those who believe in you and have your Holy Spirit. Would you give them supernatural wisdom to lead with excellence during these difficult times? We need you so much, God. Our city needs you. Our country needs you. But we pray that this change would start with us, with just me doing just the next right thing. We pray that you would bless our relationships, our conversations, and the kingdom impact that you want to bring through us. So we pray it in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Healer, and our coming King. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.